Well, look, uh, welcome to this um, public lecture. We're very fortunate to have uh, Valerio de Molly. I hope my pronunciation is um, a managing partner of the European House, uh, Amber Assetti. He, he told me he's, uh, he's just been in the region, I think, for an event in China. Yes, in Jiangsu. In Jiangsu, uh, China. He's going to be talking today about improving European competitiveness and uh, integration, and in so doing, I think, sharing with us uh, some of his uh, thinking in this, this area. Um, Valerio has a, uh, a distinguished career in terms of his current position where he's, he's been, I think, since 1999. He's the author of uh, several books, and uh, as I mentioned, he's going to be talking about this observatory on, on Europe. I guess that's the uh, terminology. So look, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think the format we're going to have is a, a lecture for perhaps around 45 minutes or so, followed by questions. But apparently you have the right to ask questions at any time, and I think the material looks uh, extremely interesting, so I hope we have a very interesting and uh, frank uh, public lecture. So thank you very much. And thanks for in inviting, having inviting, invited me here at the prestigious Singapore University to share with you our views about the topic, the European competitiveness. Professor Mabubani, who is used to uh, cooperate with us in Europe, uh, uh, last September told me that uh, the university mission is to open up more and more to the European uh, exchange of programs to the European uh, experience as well. Uh, in Europe, we look at Asia as the growing star to solving future economic problems. So we are, we are coming here with uh, 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 an approach oriented to learn, not to teach. And uh, uh, we are very fascinated about uh, the growing and exciting atmosphere that we can smell uh, throughout all Asia. And uh, as Charles was saying before, we have established since now three years in the Jiangsu province near Zhangzhou, Liyang. You know where Liyang is? It's a small lake, Tianmu Lake. You are from Jiangsu province, so you know it very well. And we established that there uh, for the willingness of the regional government, an international gathering of uh, European Italian and Chinese experts to uh, share views and discuss about not only joint venturing and business activities, but uh, overall issues of cooperation. So I was a speaker at that uh, gathering uh, together with other experts from all over the world, and uh, I decided to accept the invitation of Professor Mabubani since he's almost on, on my way back to Europe. It's not exactly <laughs> on the route, but uh, I, I accepted with great pleasure his invitation to be here. And as Charles anticipated, I would rather prefer to have an interactive uh, discussion rather than a long presentation of slides and facts and figures to bore you too much. So that is the topic, and uh, uh, let's, enter, uh, let's enter into it with more uh, deepness. A um, few considerations, first of all, about us, what's the European House Ambrosetti, just for the ones among you who don't know it. There is, of course, the website you can see, uh, www.ambrosetti.eu for Europe. You can see all the information about us, but I would like to underline a few, few aspects of our business, of our firm. A uh, few considerations about the current the current outlook, which helps us in uh, uh, giving the framework for our discussion. And then I would like to present to you this project, which started a few years ago, Observatory on Europe, which is an advisory board founded by large multinational companies, among 
which ING, uh, General Electric International, which means everything G has outside the US, Cisco, EMEA, and Suzuki Europe. So those leaders wanted us to create an advisory board with other experts to discuss about this matter, about the competitiveness of Europe, which is not an entity in itself. Europe is made by 27 member states. And so you need to be aware that when you talk about the competitiveness of Europe, there is not only one language, only one money, only one group of uh, rules of law. There are 27 different states, each one of them still with their own independence, with their own autonomy, their own legislation, and their own political life. So uh, Europe is a concept, it's more a theoretical concept rather than a practical concept, but I will enter into more details. I see some European face as well here. What I like, or, or, or maybe Western, I'm not, I don't know whether they are <laughs> European, they are American. Australian. French. French, so one European, two Europeans, maybe a few more. So uh, that is the background. Uh, about, about us, we, we are a, a company that has been founded in Italy, and we still maintain our headquarters in Milan. We are around 200 people at the moment with offices all over the world. We have 15 people in China. Our, second, our third largest office is Spain with 10, and then in the other offices we have a, a representation uh, very often with local companies from North America to South America and, and so on and so forth. We are not in Singapore yet, uh, and we, we, may, we may decide with someone of you to start up a business nobody knows. Um, this is the structure of the company. I am one of the partners and the chief executive officer of, uh, of the group. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, Ambrosetti Stone Stewart in Italy, which is doing business in the value-based management. Uh, the Ambrosetti SPA, which is the holding company, the group limited in London, as I said, Spain and China. K Finance, which is an advisor, ad advisory for corporate finance operation, mainly in Italy, and the other offices, uh, as I mentioned before. Basically, we do execute three businesses. One is the management consulting, like McKinsey, for instance, just to give you an idea of who we compete with. Another one is top executives, education and briefing services, where we have more than 2,000 lecturers from all over the world, experts from all over the world. One of them is, for instance, Professor Mabubani, uh, and many other, Professor Cheng Siwei from China, uh, uh, and Steve Roach from Hong Kong and many others also from the area. Um, and then we also have a research, a research studies and forums as an expertise, which is basically think tank groups, advisory boards, and one of these examples is the Observatory on Europe that I will present to you uh, with more detail in a moment. Uh, that is the basic framework, the basic map of our activities uh, and this is the industry focus that we try to follow. But I don't want to bore you with too many details about us. As I said, you can look in our website and you find out everything else. Uh, I start from this consideration. Uh, today, science and technology are going at a speed which has uh, not any uh, comparison with the past. Uh, you think about the fact that the human being went on Mars in a few months, in a few years, sorry, when it was supposed to last years. Things about the research in science, in medicine, not to mention about ICT and all the boom of technological developments that we had. Even the more expert individual, even the one who's studying at the Singapore University, which is, which is meant to be the best in the world, can approach the degree of speed of technology and science. A company as a group of individuals is necessarily a little bit below. A group of company is a little bit below. And then you have the starting point of the country in where you develop your activities, which is uh, something relevant, very much relevant to drive science and technology. Why I mention that? Because that distance over there, it uh, underlines 
the span of opportunities. We are living in an era which has unprecedented opportunities that we have never experienced and seen. In the same time, in the same time, if you look at the GDP growth over the last three decades, you can realize how China has regularly always been very much faster. It's three decades, and China is an example of all Asia. Uh, I, haven't put, I haven't plotted the figure for Singapore, but you can see how faster China in the last three decades went. And uh, as a matter of fact, particularly in this situation of crisis, you see the figures for, for the euro area and from the United States is giving the, the relative distance with China at the maximum ever in the last three decades. Uh, that is one important point that we have to, we have to keep in our uh, discussion as a very clear standing, starting point. Another one is that in absolute value, the EU27 still remain the first macro areas in terms of powerful, in terms of percentage of GDP uh, in the world, much ahead in the United States, as in fact, and in fact, despite the recession, we are even gaining space, as you can see. And look at China over here, which is more than, more than doubled the size in the last 10, 15 years in a relative perspective. When we talk about competitiveness, we, are, we have to always look at others. We compete with others. We are against someone else. Uh, you may know that the etymology for strat, strat, strategy is from the Greek strategos, which means to manage the army. So there is this concept of war into the matter of strategy, is in the etymological deep root of it. And look at Japan, how deep is it, is it withdrawing? The Manufacturing capacity worldwide is showing signs of unlimited uh, decrease. And that's why the, the, the recession we are living now is very much deep and structural. We are not experiencing a conjunctural short-term recession. What it is happen what's happening nowadays is uh, giving roots, deep roots for profound and deep drastic changes. Take, this, is, this is the example of the automotive worldwide industry. Uh, the uh, capacity, the saturation of the production is only two-thirds of it. And in the world we have uh, about 30 million units that we can manufacture, but there is no demand for it. Despite the entire push of the demand that all the governments all over the world are doing, which is not necessarily the right things to do. Just to give you an idea, the entire Italian market, just to take it as an, uh, an example, is 2 million cars per year. Germany is 2.2. France is 2. So you see how big is the gap uh, today. So this is just one example. I don't see any industry, particularly manufacturing industry, where you do not have a deep, excessive manufacturing capacity today. And you cannot avoid to consider that when you look into the competitiveness aspects. The employment trends. Look, the loss of jobs in the manufacturing sectors. This is just the U.S. And this, again, is showing you how deep and unique once in a lifetime is the uh, 18 months that has started 18 months ago. It's uh, unique in the history in terms of uh, fast and deep profound change. Uh, it's, it's Consider that the yellow line there, it, it's the line uh, uh, above which you start growing uh, with, with employment. So if you are, if you are rebouncing like, like that, but if you are below that line, you are still losing jobs. You lose less jobs than before, but you are still losing jobs. So look here. It's an, an unbelievable situation, once in a lifetime. If you consider, I don't have it here in the presentation, but if you consider the impact in the service industry is again showing this specular effect. 
losing jobs even in the financial sectors, particularly in the banking sector and particularly in the, in the, in the Western world. Please, in any moment. I mean, it would seem to me there's at least two aspects to that uh, type of chart. One is the, the trend changes in employment. And you know, in an economy like the U.S., the share of manufacturing in the economy is shrinking in terms of GDP, in terms of employment. And then on top of that, you have a business cycle. So you have you know, exceptional losses during this current downturn. But I mean, isn't the ultimate path the path you expect to see? I mean, that you're basically this sector is going to continue to shrink and the economy will increasingly be generating employment in the service sector. I mean, but isn't that good news? Well, I don't see at the moment the uh, generation of new employment. In the service industry, as well as in the manufacturing industry, we are losing jobs and we are continuing losing jobs. As a matter of fact, the unemployment uh, in the U.S. is still growing. We are now 10% of it. Yeah, but that's the cyclical element. And it's superimposed on a trend. And, you know, I would think for the longer term kind of issues about business opportunities and thinking about the structure, it would kind of factor in, in a sense, that this is a, a path, which is, you know, it's the U.S. has followed for the last 30 years. The share of employment in manufacturing has come way down. And I think that's inherently something you would expect to see as, is a reflection of the fact that countries like China are able to supply manufactured goods at, you know, much lower prices. Yeah, well, that's an interesting uh, point. But uh, uh, even today, the uh, Western economies, or among the Western economies, you still keep a uh, significant weight of manufacturing. And you take uh, the, the three largest of it being Japan, Germany, and Italy is the third largest manufacturing uh, presence in, in the Western, among the Western economies. Uh, and still today, we will see that we had a collapse of between 20 to 50 percent, depending on the industry, depending on the countries. And the kind of a climate change, business climate change, we are uh, seeing now, today, in this area, is something very much structural. We need to find out structural, structural response to this deep and unique change. And I don't believe that the service industry will suddenly jump into the picture uh, getting solution for new jobs. So that will remain uh, an issue a, a, and a problem, which is simply enhancing the degree of uncertainties. And uh, if, if you also consider the fact that take the overall worldwide commodity price index, just as another example to, to add to our discussion today, uh, we have experienced for more than 10 years a relatively stability. And then all of a sudden we had uh, an, an incredible peak, an incredible decrease. And now we are rebouncing uh, like that. Uh, uh, the situation is so much confused that if you take two uh, great leaders of oil companies, the guy on the left side is Mr. Scaroni, chief executive of A. ENI, which is the fifth largest petrol company in the world, with the CEO of Gazprom, Alexei Miller, in a meeting we organized in Europe. It was exactly 4th of July 2008 when the oil price was 138. One guy, one gentleman was saying 50 to 60 per barrel shortly, and the other one was predicting exactly the opposite. So, and, and those are not stupid guys. They have behind them research studies, uh, uh, activities in all over the world. So if even people like them have two opposite idea of where the world is going in their own business, uh, the message for us is that everything is dramatically hard and confused. We have no uh, recipe, we have no solution for issues like those but we have to be fast. We have to be dramatically rapid to adapt our strategy uh, and our understanding to the outside, the outside world. Uh, 
those were wanted to be just few considerations just to uh, put the framework for our for our discussion let me now enter into the observatory on europe project what was the the mission of this observatory that we have created a few years ago uh, was to contribute to the development of the european union providing its political and economic leaders as well as its citizens with high quality studies researches analysis and benchmark to build a stronger Europe from economic, social, and political standpoints. So we wanted to provide a platform for knowledge and discussion and confrontation on economic issues. Those are, uh, were the fundamental macro questions that with the business leaders I mentioned, and I will present you the, the names in a moment, uh, that we wanted to respond to. Uh, when we started was 2004, we had the impression that even in Europe there was not enough perception of the strength of Europe, of the possibilities of Europe, of the opportunities for Europe. That was much before the economic and financial turmoil and crisis that started with the failure of Lehman September 15, 2008. Um, so I, uh, uh, we wanted to uh, face those questions and to uh, offer an answer to all those uh, macro doubts. Uh, methodologically, we had this advisory board. I will tell you in a moment uh, who participated to it. And we wanted to um, analyze facts through competitiveness profile, convergence profile, and speed profile. Why convergence? Because, as I said before, Europe is uh, an assembly of 27 different member, member states, and we have agreed through the treaties, through the agreements, we have agreed uh, on a convergence path. We have agreed that on certain macroeconomic indicators as well as on certain KPI, uh, we were supposed as 27 states to converge in the same area, in the same uh, dimension. And so we wanted to, me to measure that. But we also wanted to measure the degree of speed the degree of uh, uh, how fast different member states were in that uh, process. Opinions, survey with the business leaders, uh, uh, targeted interviews, etc., and then proposals to the European Union. We had uh, uh, normally uh, every year we have a, a forum in Brussels to the parliament, to the commissioners in charge, to the business community as well. So the founder of this observatory were these multinational companies here together with us, and uh, the activities were basically the forums that we did in Budapest and Brussels and the final report. We are still going on with this process, which has been uh, highly appreciated by the European Commission in charge of economic affairs, which is uh, uh, also a sponsor for it. Uh, was, it was, uh, he was Almunia, uh, uh, as you all know, we are about to start with a new European Commission in a few weeks' time. Uh, these were the members, the members from Mario Monti, uh, president of Bocconi University and former commissioner, uh, to Peter Magesi, uh, former prime minister of Hungary, Riccardo Illi, is, uh, apart from being chairman of uh, coffee company, one of the leading coffee company in the world. He was also governor of a northeastern region of Italy called Friuli Venezia Giulia, northeast part of the country. Uh, Mitya Gaspari, Minister of the EU Affair for Slovenia. Vladimir Dlohi, he was formerly Treasury Minister of the Czech Republic and the former Vice President of the European Commission. This was the group of people that participated with us in the uh, analysis and in the work, and on the business side, uh, uh, these other uh, players from the multinational companies, plus us. Uh, the, the steps, the methodological work, since we are in an academic uh, compound, uh, I think it may be relevant for you to have a deeper understanding understanding of what there is behind the rankings and what there is behind the, the choice of the KPI. So the methodological work was in, uh, uh, is 
summarized in, in these steps the three profiles that I told you, competitiveness, convergence, and speed. Uh, the four new Europe, as we call the countries, because those countries were annexed to the European Union in 2004, so we wanted to have an understanding whether this was positive for those countries or whether that was negative. Uh, there was no clear indication, so we wanted to, to study it carefully with the facts. Uh, the areas of analysis that we have chosen was innovation, human capital, energy, and then the new Europe focused, the survey of the business leaders, and then the recommendations to improve the EU competitiveness and the integration process. Uh, that, was, that was the planning, and then we had to accept a change into the format given the economic crisis that started after the process of the, the methodological process of work uh, uh, was, was uh, uh, began. Let's enter into the uh, competitiveness profile. So in this profile, we, uh, we have chosen the so-called core countries of Europe, I mean the most relevant ones in terms of dimension, and we have taken Japan and U.S. as two counterparts, but we have also included in the analysis Turkey. You may be aware of the fact that Turkey has made a, a request for accession to the, Europe, uh, to the European Union with a great deal of discussions. There are countries, particularly France, which is particularly against it, Germany, who is rather against and in the middle, and other countries like Italy or UK, which are more in favor of the Turkish uh, access to Europe. So we, we wanted to have also an understanding of, on this part. We are not covering it today, but uh, that's just for you to know. Um, so that was the choice we made uh, among the uh, 27 member states. And the whole structure uh, brought us to identify, together with the scientific committee, uh, 76 key performance indicators that were structured in vision area, sub-vision areas, macro item, and then single KPI by KPI. That's the methodological background. I will try to give you an example in a few minutes. Um, then we have uh, ranked those KPI, that, that tree of KPI, from the less performing to the best performing counties, from zero to 10, in order to have uh, a rank in which to position the different member states in an overall picture. Uh, this is the, the structure. Uh, we have chosen those uh, vision areas inside Europe, which weighted for 70%, and outside Europe, uh, which weighted for 10%, external trade and investments block uh, as a sub-vision area. Education and innovation, we had uh, sub-vision areas. Business, 30% of it with different chapters, labor, bureaucracy, taxes, raw materials and enabling technologies, finance, state control in the economy as macro items. Welfare, people. So inside this vision area, uh, we had these four sub-vision areas and then two horizontal uh, uh, transversal aspects like the infrastructure, information society, networks, energy, and environment, uh, each accounting 10%. That's the methodological definition for the competitiveness we used. Yeah. Could you maybe give an example of how this might work with a particular item like, say, taxes or labor? I mean, you you are going to be giving a ranking between exactly. 0 and 10. Exactly. And you as the committee, and you observe, I mean, safe taxes. I mean, yeah. how, I, how would you decide on this? Yes, in that particular one, we have chosen the specific KPI. For instance, one is very easy, the corporate taxes and the personal taxes. And as you may be aware of, in Europe, we have 27 different taxation approach. 
<laughs> member states by member states. So in the evolution of it, uh, we have structured uh, member states by member states. And the, the, the better it is the tax environment, and the better it is the score. I, let me give you an example uh, with the business side, just for you to have a better understanding. So that was the overall picture of the methodological approach in the competitiveness of Europe. Inside the business uh, uh, area, which is this one, this 30% of it, right? Inside the business area, this is this, the definition. Labor, bureaucracy, taxes, etc. Inside taxes, it, we counted it for 15%. Corporate income tax rate was 50% of it. 10% rates of value-added taxes, general sales taxes, consumption taxes, and then the employer's social security contribution, 40%. That was our choice inside the taxes. So you can see how the trees develop, area by area, sub-area by sub-area, and down to the single KPI. Just to give you an example in overall productivity, uh, just as an example of it, that is the GDP per person employed in U.S. Uh, dollars, which is this KPI here inside the labor area, which is counting for 30%. So the, it is highly modelized, you see. So I'm now picking up this KPI, the overall productivity, measured by these indicators. As you can, as you can see, those are all the European countries uh, you can see in the yellow line the non-European countries. As I said, we wanted to have U.S., Japan, and Turkey for the reasons that I have mentioned. And you can see, all, I hope that you can read from behind. Uh, you have, for instance, Germany, Italy, Austria, Netherlands, Spain here, and so on and so forth. And you can see uh, zero is Turkey and ten is France. And the, because we limit it to the core Europe, and so the other European countries which are out of the core Europe can score more in a relative distance to the best one. That's the way we did it. Scott, um, I mean, you've got some objective indicators, but if you go back to the previous slide, I noticed, for example, state control gets a weight of 10%. Um, how did you arrive at these weighting schemes? I mean, where do the numbers come from? Well, that's a, also, that's a very good question. In order to arrive to that choice of indicators, we have to be consistent in terms of source within that uh, number of indicators. Uh, so we, used, we have used an enormous number of sources from the OECD to the World Bank, uh, from the European Central Bank to the European Commission itself, uh, and so on and so forth. But that, that's the raw ingredients. I mean, I, you're constructing an index and you're going to weight these things. Yes. I, I'm wondering where these weights come from. I mean, let's take state that, No, the choice of the weights was our qualitative decision with the advisory board made by yes. business leaders and scientific committee experts. So that was, that was our decision. That, that's a subjective decision. Exactly. Which is sort of interest. Why would state control have a weight of 10 percent? I mean, if you had a heavily regulated economy, I would think that might influence many features of its performance. You know, yeah, that's, uh, that's a, a choice. But yeah. given, the, given, the fact, given the fact that we had to take into account all, all this group of indicators, you know, uh, in our opinion, mm -hmm. that could account for as much as 10 percent. That was our qualitative decisions. It could, uh, uh, we could have put 20 and 5 and 10, but then someone could have, would have said, why you count finance for 5? So uh, we, we have decided in our approach that in the business side, uh, first point was labor and the number of KPI in labor, then bureaucracy, then taxes, and enabling technologies slash raw materials price, then finance and state control at the same level. That was our uh, decision within the 30% of the business weight, you see? So this is 
uh, the way we have decided to weight the different indicators. You, you may say uh, this should be a little bit more, this should be a little bit less, or vice versa. No, uh, that's true. But the, the, the fact is that having modelized it, you can change the ranking and the analysis by, uh, uh, by deciding all these changing. But the group of business leaders and the scientific committee we had, uh, we all decided that that was the appropriate decision to have. And uh, of course, I, I'm oversimplifying now, but we have had uh, hours of discussions, even for the single KPIs, because you could have chosen others. But we have decided and agreed on those overall 76 KPIs that we have regrouped in those matrix of sub-vision areas, vision areas, and macro uh, overall vision. But you're right. I mean, we could have decided differently. So to go back to these indicators, that gives you an overall size. Uh, the, di the comparative dimensions are, are allowing analysis in the absolute performance evolution as well as in the relative performance uh, position evolution, which means you can look in absolute terms how you're going compared with the previous year, but you can also see you may go very well compared with the previous year, but see if others are doing extremely better, you are losing competitiveness despite the fact that you are doing better yourself. So we wanted to uh, uh, have both aspects under control. So the first one is the absolute evolution. And you can see these, in these, uh, the other strengths of the model is that the, 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 the visualization of it is really uh, unique because in only one page, you can have an overall picture of uh, the overall situation where yellow means stability, plus or minus 5%. Red means you are doing worst. Uh, green means you're doing better. So that's the example for Germany, for instance. And you can see how Germany, just to give you an example of this, is doing uh, relatively better in education and innovation with all KPI stable and three better, but is doing much worse in business where two for six KPIs are doing worse and few others better and so on and so forth. So in, in the overall picture of Germany, for instance, you have 32 improvements, 31 stability, and 13 uh, recession, to going backward, which is not a statistics in itself. This is the basic, the basic for having the good understanding to have then the policy actions. Is the basis to say this is the picture, the overall picture of the situation, and we, we can do that Member state by, by member state. This is the, the strength of the methodological approach. And then, uh, in terms of education and innovation, just as another example of representation, so you can have a look into the single country as before, Germany, France, Italy, and so on. Of course, I'm not showing you all detailed analysis country by country, but just to give you the overall message or you could, you could have a vertical understanding for that vision area, in this case, education and innovation, how different countries are going in that particular vision area. In this case, uh, Japan is, extre is, is doing a lot of improvements in this. When I say improvement, the case was 2007 against 2005. So it was that span uh, of the analysis. And France is doing the worst, only two improvements and two decrease, seven stability, and then upwards the other countries. So you can have, in terms of competitiveness analysis, you can have a full picture, country by country, or vertically, vision area by vision area. And this is the example of education and innovation. Another way of looking at it is to have an overview in terms of countries' absolute performance and to see them all together in terms of performance. 
Uh, you can see how Spain did it relatively better uh, with this approach, Germany, and then Italy, and so on. Uh, United States has shown signs of uh, decrease in their competitiveness. This, is, this was before the start of the economic crisis, so what happened later could have been uh, worsened in a significant way uh, this, this approach. And Turkey was not doing so good in terms of improvements, uh, rather uh, stability. So that's another way of looking at it, not only country by country or vertically, but all together in a unique map. Only one page, full uh, analysis and full uh, detail. Uh, just to give you an example of the relative position, now we have seen it on, uh, uh, on the side of the absolute values. Let's enter now into the competitiveness profile relative to each other. Again, the methodological approach was the same. This is the uh, overall picture, which is putting the U.S. in this position here. Uh, Finland is the best competitive of the member states. Denmark, U.K. coming third. And then you can see all the others down to Turkey, Greece, and Italy in the third last point. Uh, and that gives us an inf an in another picture of the information is in relative terms where all different countries are positioned. And you can see the Nordic approach as a winning approach in Europe vis-a-vis others, is it the southern, for instance, or the eastern European approach. The differences are remarkable. This picture is showing you another message, which is in the last, I told you that we have started in 2004, so we have every two years we come up with the overall profile. So if you look at it in perspective, 2005, 7, and 9, of course, we, we didn't change those, those relative weights. So we fixed it at the very beginning, <coughs> and we are keeping it consistently. Otherwise, we would lose the meaning. So you, you can see, like, for instance, United States has decreased their performance even before the economic and financial crisis uh, took place. And they lost 0, 30 uh, points of margin in, in this index. Germany is picking up, Japan is picking up, France is highly stable, Spain is stable, would say, and also Italy is stable, and Turkey is picking up from a uh, bottom line of this kind. Yes, please, in any moment. Um, maybe coming back um, two slides um, where Finland is shown as the most competitive. I wonder what the collapse of the financial system um, what impact that will have in terms of it dropping substantially on competitiveness? Uh, the Finland, you said? Yeah. It's showing how their model uh, is bringing them to the first position in this indicator. And still uh, now, out of the crisis, their welfare uh, approach, their welfare system, proved to be one of the most resilient, one, one of the more, most stable inside the entire European Union. So it's likely to stay in that position in a year's time? I think so. Okay. But I have not the figures of 2010, uh, but uh, uh, in, this, in this sense, uh, you see, it's, uh, uh, the, distance, the relative distance to the others is quite remarkable. Mm. Because you have to consider that you come up with this index number after the process of all the other 76 indicators. So if you are the number one within a, a, such a broad approach, it means that your competitiveness is really uh, at the best le possible level among European countries. Look at the relative distance, for instance, with Italy. It's the double. Can, can I ask a question, though? Sure. Uh, number have? I mean, is it, would one say that Finland in some sense is going to perform better? 
is it that you would say Finland is a better place for a business to invest in? I'm not quite sure what the index number feeds into. The index numbers is uh, giving evidence to the fact that the overall competitiveness of Finland, but also Denmark, UK, and so on and so forth, not only for business. Business is accounting 30% of it. We had the other indicators, environment, for instance, infrastructure, information technology, education, others. others. So uh, this is giving evidence in a relative way as well as in absolute values way, that the Nordic European model is, you know, giving evidence of the fact that those countries are doing better in terms of competitiveness, in terms of overall results within that group of indicators that have been chosen. But, I mean, if a business were to look at this, I mean, let's, you mentioned the, the welfare system in the Nordic states, which if you're living in those countries, is a great thing, presumably. But if I'm an international investor, it's not obvious it's going to be a great thing for me. I mean, I'm, in a sense, you're, you're validating your prize. You think a welfare system with a certain structure is a good thing. You weight it 30%, you come up with a high rating. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, where as, again, are. that's not welfare is just 10% of it. Is just 10% of it, so it cannot be only for the welfare for the welfare situation that they are winning, because this is accounting for 10%. They are winning because this, in the sum of the business indicators, the education and innovation indicator weighting 20%, the people indicators, the external trade and investments, the environment weighting 10%, and the infrastructure weighting another 10%. So in the sum of all of it. They are the best. The welfare is accounting 10%, so it's just one. I mentioned the welfare because that is the, the first thing that come up to your mind when you think about the Nordic model differences, but they are very much ahead in education and innovation. We see we have a few data on R&D and on the quality of the education system. They are one of the best. They are one of the best in terms of people mobility, citizen security, and demographic structures, the area that we have been choosing. They are among the best in business, etc. So it's a sum of, all, of everything. It's not just one single specific. That is the strength of it, because it's grouping together all different KPIs. And the final output is the one that we have seen. Please. Related. So um, would that make sense to regress your results on the FDI in each country and see if, it's, if it makes sense? So Finland would attract most FDI, and then you would have Denmark and then United Kingdom. And then if it's not the case, then maybe there's a problem in your index. Or FDI is not your measure. Your FDI own. is inside that group of people we call outside Europe. So we are, we are accounting also the FDI attraction. That is important. We have counted for that weighted uh, sum that you have seen. So the, uh, uh, it's one of the interesting aspects that you have to consider. Again, not the only one. Uh, what are you trying to do with this competitiveness profile? Is to give a policy recommendation for the governments or to say well, is that so it's not to attract foreign investors? No, foreign it's, investors it's a very really good question, like a, a good point. Uh, I should have stressed it before and better at the beginning. Uh, what's, uh, the, the mission of the group is the one that you have seen, to provide a clear, genuine understanding of the picture of the situation for competitiveness, integration, and speed. I will show you the profiles of integration and speed in a moment. And to offer to the political leaders uh, a genuine uh, opportunity of firstly understand the situation, in absolute value and, com and, and com in a comparative value, and to take actions. And the actions must be different country by country in function of the relative positions that you may have area by area. So this is, pro this is providing uh, per, per every member state and per every vision area a very clear understanding of the starting point. 
And for instance, even Finland, they have key weaknesses that they have to recognize and, and against which they have to act, even though they are first. But again, what's the purpose for the business leaders of GE and Cisco? Because they, they are the ones who have sponsored it, who wanted it. They use this as a map for deciding investments, for a map as deciding where to put what. You know, they are all multinational companies. GE only, they have more than 100,000 employees only in Eastern Europe. And they wanted to have a clear understanding of what they were doing country by country. So there is a lot of background information that it, 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 I'm not going to show you here, but that is useful raw materials for corporate strategies as well. So on one hand, and that's an interesting point, because we have grouped together, together more needs, the, the political stakeholders, because they use this as an action plan, as a basis for an action plan, and we also suggested to the European Commission and the member states few priorities for actions, but also the uh, sponsor side, they were using this as an understanding of weaknesses and strengths. And when you call GE or Cisco or ING that you have activities in all 27 countries, you must know and you want to know exactly how it, it develops the competitiveness and what's, uh, what is foreseeable for the future. I have one more question. Please. Um, what, I mean, this obviously is probably far more developed than the OECD World Competitiveness Report. Did you base your results on it? Did you compare your results to it? Or how do you relate the two reports together? Well, there are many reports uh, from World Bank, from the OECD, from the World Economic Forum, from everybody. But we wanted to have our proprietary approach to it. So we wanted to decide ourselves what weight to give. And also, I found, for instance, the weakness of the World Economic Forum report is that they base a lot, a great percentage of it is based on qualitative self-declaration from the business community. So, if they, they can uh, just give you an example. If you, have, if you are a country like Italy, for instance, but also France, who tends to be highly self-critical within their own uh, internal matters, uh, and you have another country like take Germany or U.S. or others who are on the contrary, who tend to be highly self-proud of whatever they achieve, you enter into the indicator a great degree of subjectiveness. In this model, it's just facts. The only uh, subjective aspect is the decision of the, weight, the weighted uh, map that we wanted to apply for the vision areas, etc., uh, but in the end, we used a lot of good sense, good business practice to allocate those decisions. It's criticable, of course, uh, but there is a meaning behind. So we, we, don't, we don't want to say that this model is the only way of looking at competitiveness across European countries, but at least uh, it has a lot of plus and benefits and I'm trying to uh, explain them. And then there are other models at, of looking at the competitiveness, of course, uh, but this is ours. You wanted to say something? Australia is not in it. <laughs> Maybe it's an idea for the next edition of it. Uh, you couldn't really use this model to make a statement about the com competitiveness of Europe overall, could you? Because uh, the com competitiveness of Europe would have to be compared to uh, the competitiveness of Asia, which is the main competitors with all Western countries these days. So especially you're sitting in this school and you're studying the rise of Asia. Um, do you think you could adjust this model to, to look at other countries like that, or would you have to have a fundamental change in all your weightings and yeah. observations? To, because, I mean, I, I have a feeling that a lot of the weightings and observations in, uh, and KPIs in this model are somewhat Eurocentric. Yeah. So my question is, I guess, do you think uh, you could use this model to make comparisons and judgments about the competitive, competitiveness of the EU overall? It doesn't exist, the EU, in overall. It doesn't exist. It's just a theoretical concept. It's a political concept, you know. But then you have uh, the real member states. And so that, that was my initial premise, my initial point. 
in order to look at the competitiveness of Europe, you have to understand the competitiveness of the pillars of Europe, which are 27 different pillars. And we go from 5,000 euro per capita of GDP to up to 50,000 in Luxembourg Europe per capita of the GDP. How can you deal it as it was the same entity? It's not. Even the euro. England is not using the euro, for instance. Other European countries, they are not. So you have different currencies, different policies, different law system, different taxes, different performance. As you see here, the performance member states by member states are very different. That's why our point is that there is no competitiveness of Europe in itself, but there is an understanding of the different nuances inside the old Europe. And the for Asia would be the same. What happens in Korea or, or Vietnam or China or India or Singapore is completely different. Different currencies, different policies, different everything. The advantage for Europe is that there is the willingness towards a direction of a more unified system, that there is a strong currency, and uh, it is much true so with the weakness of the, dollar, of the U.S. dollars, and it will be even more so in the future years. So uh, I would like that there is an understanding of Europe as a, an, a, 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 an area uh, also of laboratory of political <laughs> Uh, experimentation for the future years. But we, we cannot mm, discuss about the competitiveness of Europe as an integrated institution, which is not. I hope that responds to your question. It may be interesting to look into Asia uh, in, that, in the same manner, uh, but Asia has no commissioners for Asia. There is no a unified system representing Asia uh, in itself. Could you use this, uh, this uh, system to uh, compare individual European countries to other countries and uh, their competitiveness in a w more global system? Because it seems as though it's a very uh, uh, an insulated uh, model, this, because you're only comparing European countries with each other. No, oh, this is a, a very good point. We are. Uh, we have opened the comparison to U.S. and Japan and Turkey, uh, but we could in very easily include wherever uh, uh, other countries we, we wish. I mean, the model is there. It's just a matter of sourcing the right numbers, the right facts, and we could compare whoever else countries we decide to. Simply, I mean, I, I would have needed 200 meters of uh, slides <laughs> to include others, it's, it, it would be relatively easy to do so. It has been our decision so far to look into the compet competitive areas, just looking into these three non-European countries, the US and Japan, rightly or wrongly, we're talking about the second and third largest group, uh, and Turkey for the reasons I told you that it is uh, under a session for the European Union. We could do it with China, we could add Australia, we could add India, we could add whoever else we need. It may be interesting to come back in a, in a year time, having more Asian countries into the map. But I think this touches on another question yeah. that was raised about, I mean, are the weightings Eurocentric? I mean, if you were to apply this to China, would you put the same weights on state control, on labor? I mean, is welfare, I mean, it's, the, the weights are decided by your group. Yes. Um, you're kind of trying to reflect the preference function of the companies that are represented here, which I think are largely European companies. American, largely. American, largely American companies? Yes, uh, I, uh, GE International, uh, okay, Cisco, okay. Suzuki Europe, and then there is ING Group, uh, okay. which is a, a European group. Okay. But um, would you apply the same types of weights to look at China or This is a good question. India, which interestingly you don't have an option. Yes. I notice you every brick but the eye. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. 
To answer to you, I would say, would it really make sense to compare the competitiveness of India to France? Honestly, like the goal, I guess, of this study is more to compare what's going on in Europe and have some benchmark for United States and Japan since they're pretty much on the same. Well, that's how I guess. To... Do you mean by competitiveness? And I mean, I notice every country can become more competitive the way you've defined it. Uh, yes. Am I right? Yes, it's right. Yeah. What, what, what is it exactly? Is it, is it a relative? Is it an absolute concept? No, of course it is relative to others because you compete with someone else. It's the etymological structure oh, yeah, yeah. is to be in war. Yeah. Um, it's more an economic and theoretical war than fortunately a practical one. But it is against or vis-a-vis -vis someone else. And uh, what our definition of the, of the competition is to find out uh, six simple questions to very uh, simple, uh, si uh, simple answer to very simple questions. I mean, you should uh, answer why a company is ready to invest in your own territories or in other territories. Where a company who is already there is not eager to move away why a student is willing to come to your territory to study, why a talent is attracted to work in your territory, in the companies of your territory, to work, why a tourist should choose your country to come and have tourism and enjoy himself, why a taxpayer, that is the, sec the sixth layer of the competitiveness approach, why a taxpayer should decide to stay there and pay taxes in that particular territory and nation, and not rather in, in others. So that is our definition of it, and, and all of this background is providing not only the picture, but also the food for thought and for action to the corporate world, and that's why the major multinational companies are participating and they, and they invest in having this understanding, but also to the political leadership of the member states and of the European Commission, because that is our perspective. We are driven by that angle. If we would come to China, that would be interesting, but probably it would, the, the comparison would, be, would make more sense either through the BRICS country or through the Asian countries. And maybe you are perfectly right, the, the choice of the relative weights maybe even the choice of the specific KPI may be different because that is done in function of the reality of the facts of that specific moment, which is not comparable, as uh, our lady was suggesting before, uh, uh, to the situation in France, for instance. Yeah. Can I ask you, we, we've got about 10 more minutes, can I ask you a practical question? Given the large number of indicators, I mean, this is a major exercise updating this data and making these judgments within little boxes about, you know, what's happened on taxes, etc. cetera. Um, is it possible to kind of, and particularly if you are going to expand this, is it possible to kind of reduce this down to a much smaller set of variables? Because this seems to me like a very... You had a question? Um, yes. Um, <laughs> I, I find that your, your weighting, for example, on people, you only uh, allot 10%. But in fact, uh, the, uh, um, the long-term competitiveness, as I see it, is the uh, demographic decline uh, in uh, European countries, especially in Italy and, and Germany. Um, how you address the, uh, the long-term competitiveness of Europe um, uh, when uh, you mentioned about the uh, quality statistics on uh, manufacturing, because the uh, demographic chain is uh, closely related to, to the manufacturing. Uh, in, uh, in Italy and in Germany, you know, you see um, um, the uh, population uh, is going, you know, uh, uh, growing year by year, and, uh, you know, um, this is, uh, you know, the experience, you know, when I work in, in, in London, um, you, you can find that, you know, um, um, the, the weightings you, you allocate to people is, I would say, is underweight. Of course, you know, your other 
uh, weightings, you know, on, on uh, say, business, you know, and uh, uh, um, uh, welfare or on the um, uh, um, uh, governments. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's fine, but, but uh, you know, I, I would say, uh, you know, repeat uh, emphasis against, you know, the weightings on people. And uh, in fact, your slides show that, you know, in the, uh, you know, a people's box, uh, um, especially the top, the demographic structures are all in, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, um, the, um, I can't say yellow color, or I call it deep yellow color. Uh, so would you like to address how the you call it, European country replenish their stock? Yes. Uh, I see that the weight we decided is creating a turmoil, <laughs> and, that's, uh, and that's right. In fact, that, is the, that has been a subjective evaluation uh, of the team and of the advisory board overall. You are right. That could have been a little bit higher, but in function of the complexity of all the system, uh, that could not have been doubled, because if you double that, you have to have something else, and then someone will come up say, saying, why you, sh you have have the innovation and education? Why you have have, have the environment? Isn't that important as the aging society? So it's always a, an overall balance. You have 100 points to allocate, and then you have to uh, consider a quite, quite a, a broad and sophisticated map uh, it may be a few, po few points more, you're right, uh, but not that much more in, f in consideration of all the other aspects. And uh, in terms of the aging society, I think that, uh, and sorry, two other considerations that your intervention uh, give, give to, to me. Um, the aging society is, uh, is certainly one. Uh, and uh, um, on this matter, I think that there is an excessive worrying because you, someone has to explain to me why an aged professor or consultant or manager or service person is not of even greater value after when he is retiring. So if we think in the old mentality, when you arrive at a certain stage and then you go in retirement, you, you sit down and you wait your pension system to pay you, I think that these in few years' time will be completely changed. We have to put the aging society back to the picture and to extract the value they can give it, they can give it to the community. Uh, that is not the same for the mining people, who fortunately are a little percentage of the overall employee employment system, that may be the case for the very, very hard work, which fortunately are the vast minority of all the, work, the workers. So this matter of the aging society is more a short-term, short-minded uh, approach. It is a worrying factor at the moment because with the rules of today, it will be a disaster. But we have to change glasses and we have to look at it differently. This is one of the key messages we gave to the Commission, for instance. We don't need to sort the problem of the aging society having in mind the last decade's input. Today, scientists have shown, and we have uh, also a scientific committee on science in Europe, has already demonstrated how the life expectation today could be up to 120 years. So can you imagine? If you have 120-year average life expectation, it means that someone would live 140 years. And you go in pension in, at 61, 62, 63, depends on the countries. I do not know about Singapore. What's the retirement age here? I retire, it would be 65. 65. <laughs> at the moment, it's 62. Why should, why should it be 65? You have to work until 100 years. And you have to give value to the community for the experience that you would have got. I, I realize this is very strong. The, the unions of the world would be very much against. But this is a fact. There will be no solution other to see the aging society as an opportunity. 
not as a problem as, as it is the case today. Uh, that's just a comment I want to make about the competitiveness of the future that will depend on the inputs for the future. So I'm looking at the present because what interests me is the actual picture in order to take the right decision to modify the future. If you project towards the future the same rules and expectations that you had in the past, you arrive with something either sad or uh, disastrous. Okay. Look, I think we've only got about five minutes more, so would, would you like to maybe sum up and then we can open for a couple more questions? Our time constraint, I guess, is 6.30. Very good. Um, very fast. I want to show you our speedometer about the speed, which we are very proud of, and uh, I'd like to have your challenge on that one, too. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, very shortly, you can see then uh, another in interesting information is that country by country, you can see how the change in competitiveness realized uh, one uh, one exercise after the others in their specific sub-components. So you can see area by area how it developed uh, as a, in, in a trend overall. Because you may have a, a full picture of stability, as it is the case of France, but inside you have a quite significant difference in within. And then you realize that the only positiveness France did was in the environment area, in those two years, with drawbacks in the, other, in the other area. So that's another piece of information which is relevant both to policymakers and to uh, business leaders and multinational companies. That is the case of Germany, that is the case of Italy, uh, which, for instance, Italy did exactly the contrary. Uh, a quite relevant increase in business side, worst in people, worst in external trade and investment, which is the FDI here, worse in infrastructure, better in environment with overall slight increase. And so on. I don't bore you with all the others. You can see all the others. Uh, another way of looking into it, it seems complex, but it's very easy. You can see in only one page the vertical, vertical analysis, country by country, the overall positioning, and the horizontal ranking by vision areas. So one page, all the messages, one picture. It's extremely uh, effective in terms of uh, communication. Uh, another way of looking at it is in putting yellow, our approach, yellow, green, and red. It gives you a full picture country by country. Again, I do not have time enough to you know, comment in details. The speed profile may be interesting, and then we stop here for a few minutes of final discussion. You know that the European Union has set specific objectives since the Lisbon Treaty on. So we have been defined in employment area, in R&D, in education, in internal market aspects, in environment, the objectives, the objectives which are here stated. These are commonly agreed objectives since the Maastricht Treaty and the Lisbon Treaty uh, has been defined. So there are specific targets for all the 27 member states. And we have clearly stated here, uh, which is also another problem because there is a lack of communication even within Europe about what are the key targets, what are here for, what we have to fight for. So these are the key, the key ten targets, and this is the time frames that we have been analyzing those targets. Uh, we have done this for all 27 members. You see here the legenda and Turkey. And that's an example, for instance, in total employment rate, the percentage of persons aged 15 to 64 in employment on the total population of the same age group. The target is 70%. The EU27 average in terms of change 2007 on 2000 is this, or nearly 4%. And you can see all the countries where they are ranked. So you have a group of countries which are much above the objective and 
a lot of other countries among the 27 which are very much lacking behind. The dark blue is the, <coughs> the EU-12, so-called, the original uh, group of countries, and the other one is the Eastern European countries, as you can see. So you see the difference. You said before, uh, how do we look at the European competitive? This is just one indicator. Look how different is the performance, both in absolute value and in degree of speed that they use. And some of the countries, like Portugal or Romania, for instance, they are even doing backwards. They are worse now than they were in 2000 for this specific indicator. And then you see it in another picture. The OK is the ones that have already uh, 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 reached the goal, and so on. That's the R&D expenditure, which, as you may know, should account for 3% of the GDP. This is a budget definition from the EU. Look, only two countries, Finland and Sweden, they are above the target, the vast majority of all other countries. So that gives you an idea of the competitiveness of Europe and the different nuance that there are behind. Look at the differences. And so the final picture, we did that for all the KPIs. The final picture is what we call the speedometer. It's like what you have in your car, in your bike, in your bicycle. And you see here it's very evident with all those KPIs for that span of uh, nearly 10 years' time, uh, the speedometer is saying to us that the EU average is 6.5, uh, 1 to 10. The Nordic countries, again, Denmark to Sweden to Finland to Latvia, are doing fast. Then you have a Central European model, and then you have the Southern Mediterranean model, and unfortunately the Eastern model, which is lacking behind. Benelux is doing worse. Luxembourg, uh, Luxembourg is less significant uh, because of the dimension. So talking about a very limited small country, and uh, also it is also true that on a lot of KPI they are already arrived. So it's not that relevant that Luxembourg is doing as low. Okay, and then you can see. Uh, when you map this two years after two years, you can see who's accelerating mo with momentum and who's not. And this is also another very precious information about competitiveness that you have to consider. It's not only important the absolute value, the, com the relative value, but also the relative speed, how you are accelerating or decelerating. You may be absolute value important, relative value still good enough, but you are decelerating. So that's another important ingredient to the picture. That's all. Okay, well, look, uh, thank you uh, very much. I, I think, unfortunately, we've kind of uh, overshot the uh, 6.30 uh, deadline, but I think this is a very uh, interesting, a very useful uh, presentation. I think it's given uh, a lot of food for thought, so maybe if we could uh, extend our uh, appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I wish to all of you the best success in, at university and in life. And uh, I have a flight uh, 11.45, so I have time enough also for extra questions, <laughs> apart from the official timing that is set okay. by professor. Okay, that's very uh, generous of you. Um, well, look, sure. So maybe if anyone wants to raise any questions or uh, maybe do it uh, bilaterally, is that okay? Please. Um, my question is regarding the, the kinds or the range of products that are being manufactured within Europe by the different European countries. I think to a large extent they are also different. So is there an attempt to look at the sectoral competitiveness or industrial competitiveness? It's a very good point. In fact, the focus, the focus for 2009 and 10 would be to look into the manufacturing uh, industries. And you are perfectly right. I mean, Europe is suffering, among others, for the uh, drop in the manufacturing output in this period, particularly two countries, Germany and Italy, 
with drops that goes from, as I said before, from 20 to 50 percent in the last quarter of 2008 and the first quarter of 2009 only, depending on the different industries and, uh, and aspects. So you're perfectly right. When we talk about manufacturing in Europe, you have all different uh, perspectives. You have, for instance, France, which is strong in the aerospace, in the nuclear energy, which are very much on the priorities today. You have Italy, which is more uh, focused on the famous 4A, arredamento alimentare, which is food, furniture, uh, fashion, uh, and, what, uh, and automotive. Uh, these are the four pillars of the industrial uh, traditional capacity in Italy, for instance. So you're perfectly right. There are completely different group of industries, country by country, and, uh, and that is one issue that must be understood and uh, deeply analyzed as well. You had another question? Yes. Um, are you considering any evolution of the indicators? Because I, I feel like you're, you're on this well, you're on, on the way to continue this survey every, every two years. Yeah. So is there going to be a future survey, and are you going to evaluate the possibility of um, changing the weights that you put? Because it, it seems like in the future we might discover that a sector might be more important or an indicator might be actually more revelator of uh, some, something than another one. Yeah. Now, that's a good point. Uh, you know, if we do make changes in the choice of KPI or in the choice of the relative weight, we would need to remake backwards all the statistics in order to make it comparable, uh, which is relatively easy to do because everything is computerized. As you can imagine, we don't work with a piece of paper. Uh, um, so it, it's easy to make any change, but so far we decided to keep it as such. Uh, we may experiment different approach. Yes, why not? But it's not in the screen. Uh, the, the advisory board, the observatory in Europe, is a, regu is a permanent observatory which com comes up with the report every two years. But we work, we continue working uh, by, uh, in the dialogue and in the common understanding inside the group with the business leaders continuously. We have meeting every, th every three months for half a full day in Milan or Brussels or everywhere else, Paris, etc., uh, with, uh, with the advisory board as such. And so we keep analyzing aspects. We've been uh, facing now the issue of manufacturing, for instance, which, on which we will go out with a focus next year, 2010. And did you change the, the, the firms participating in the survey in, in terms of the evaluation? Because you, you said you had GE and um, Cisco and those kind of firms, but you might consider new important partners that are operating in Europe? Yes, sure. We can consider others. You know, those were the founders of the observatory. And since the beginning was part of the principle to have a limited group of companies, because otherwise everybody's bringing his own priorities, it's already difficult to deal with five. So our maximum was five, but there, there have been already a few changes, because Suzuki Europe have been added last year, and probably will go out because of the crisis in the automotive in the next year. So there is a little bit of change, which gives us also fresh new perspective and, and competence as well. Also in the advisory board, there have been changes. We had Laurent Fabius, for instance, two years ago with us, uh, that you know very well, former Fra prime minister of France. And so also in that aspect, we may have Jean-Paul Fitoussi this year, uh, this, next, this following year. So we, we have a little bit of rotation uh, not exaggerated uh, because of those reasons I said. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. Have thanks a, to you. Have a good flight. Thank you. <laughs>